All right, so today's targets are to use function notation to describe a mathematical situation, including in context, and understand, understand the, use the terms domain, range, independent, dependent variable, and asymptote. Um, all year, we are going to be looking at things four ways. Uh, numerically, which means by table. Graphically, which is pretty obvious. A graph, algebraically, is our equations. And verbally, or written, is in words. You should be able to switch from one to the other, and you should be able to describe many situations in all four ways. Often one will be the better one, and so we will look at that too. But you want to be able to switch and understand mathematical problems in all ways. And when we get to words or verbally, we want to be as descriptive as possible. So before we start, let's look at a couple of definitions. Um, one thing you need to know, we would assume that you know what an ordered pair is. And it's any point x, y, uh, and you should know that the x comes first and the y is second, and that this is my independent variable and y is my dependent variable. In other words, input, output, um, independent, dependent. So uh, a relation is any set of ordered pairs. So we could take a set of many points, and that's what we call a relation. Um, graphs, lots of graphs, lots of equa equations give us relations. And then we want to talk about more specifically as a function. It is a very particular kind of relation. So function would fall underneath the relation category. And it's very specific. Functions are relations for which each value of the independent variable, so in, in other words, every x value in our domain has only one corresponding value of the dependent variable. So every x gives only one y. What does that look like? If we think about our function as something like a juicer, it could be any, it's a process. You take an input, our independent variable or our input, you do something to it, and you get our output. So I like to sometimes think about a function as, say, a juicer. If I put in an orange into a juicer, out comes orange juice. So orange is in my, is in my domain and orange juice is in my range. If I put in a dirty sock, out theoretically would come dirty sock juice. Now, as long as for every input, one output comes out, that's a functioning juicer. Put an apple juice out, apples out comes apple juice. I get into a problem, it's not a function, if putting in an orange sometimes gets me out orange juice, but other times gets me out dirty sock juice. That is not a functioning juicer. If I have an input, I have to know exactly which output will come out every time for that input, and it has to be the same. So one input giving me two outputs is not good, and really we wouldn't want dirty sock juice. We would only want that if we put in a dirty sock. All right. If we think about functions graphically, um, Every input has one output means if I take an x value, say right here, there is one and only one y. And that will only happen if we pass what's called the vertical line test, right? Every input, so if I have this input over here, right there, that gives me one output. And this graph does pass the vertical line test, so it is a function. If I look at graph B, however, right here, for any x, there are actually two separate outputs. That is not a function. That's my orange giving me orange juice sometimes and dirty sock juice sometimes, not a function. If you try the next two on your own, you could pause the video and try them. But here we go. C starts off looking like a function, but up once we get out here, it is not a function. So, because it fails the vertical line test. So it can pass for part of it, but if it fails any in any one spot, then it is not a function. D is a function. It is very curvy, but it does pass the vertical line test. All right. A couple other terms we're going to talk about, because um, they often have, they're important in terms of a problem in context, our y-intercept and x-intercept. A y-intercept is a point where the graph crosses the y-axis. So if we think back to one of these, our y-intercepts, here's the y-axis, here is a y-intercept, here is my y-intercept. This one has two y-intercepts, 
and this one has one y-intercept right up there. Those are my y-intercepts. Um, they are the they are the y values I get when x is zero, and as a result, so my x is zero, and then I get some number for my y. In a problem in context, that's what we often call our starting value. If you think about x being time or our input being time, at time zero, how much of our quantity do we have? What are we starting with? Um, x-intercepts are sort of the opposite. If you think of y as being your quantity, the amount you have, um, when does that reach zero? So it's the point where we cross the x-axis. If I think back up here, my x-intercepts, this graph has two, this graph has lots, and if I think about it continuing, it probably has infinitely many, this graph has two, and this one has one. So our x-intercepts um, will always be of the form a0. It's our x value when y is 0. So my y is 0, what do I get for a? When do I run out of my quantity? If it's a real world type situation. All right. So now we're going to look at a problem and we're going to look at it all four ways and we're going to see the relationships between those things. So if I say my situation is I pour a cup of coffee and I want to look at the temperature of that coffee over time, assuming that we do not drink the coffee. Um, you could verbally say, what's going to happen to the temperature? I hope people would understand that is going to decreases. And let's actually put the temperature decreases. Now that is a true statement. It is a true description of what happens to the coffee temperature over time. However, it is not particularly specific. If I look at a graph, I can possibly be more specific. So here, a graph is much more descriptive. Now, I can also make a better description of what's happening with my coffee, and I can use the information in the graph. I see right here, if I think about my y-intercept, right there, I could say that the coffee is at 90 degrees Celsius, at zero minutes, then it, the temp temperature decreases. And here we can be even as specific as how does it decrease? Is it steady? Is it slower and then more quickly? Or is it more quickly and then slower and slower? It starts, decreases quickly at first, then more slowly leveling off near 20 degrees Celsius. Now this graph is a theoretical type model because really I think that the, the coffee would hit this room temperature of 20 degrees. What we have on our graph is called an asymptote and this is a horizontal asymptote. It's that y value will get closer and closer to 20 degrees Celsius but never hit it. However, I think realistically it will actually hit room temperature. So our asymptote is that line we get closer and closer to but never touch. In our practical model, we would touch it. And theoretically, you actually there are graphs that will touch asymptotes, in particular horizontal asymptotes like this one. Okay. Um, we can also look at this same thing algebraically and numerically. So here's an equation that models this. If I type in my equation in my y equals, and um, it would give me that same graph. And I can look at my table. Um, I can do my table set. I could look at it every one minute and see what kind of table I get if I do second graph, which is my table. So every one minute, my temperature is 90, and then 76, and then 64. And you can see that it is decreasing in temperature less and less each minute. Or you could go up by fives, right? If we're practicing our calculator table set, you can go up by five, and that would give me the table that I had right over here. Very similar, starting at 90, but this one matches better. So we can, so that also tells us over time, as we move, as time increases, our temperature always also increases, but it is, it does seem like it is leveling off. Uh, here we have our function notation. So f, and our function notation is generally that y is f of x. If I think about up here, 
T, my temperature. So this entire quantity is my temperature. And that is also represented by the entire equation. The x is my input. And in this case, we input our minutes or our time. And if I input my minutes, this, this process, this function, gives me my temperature. And so the entire thing is my temperature. My temperature is my output. So if I'm confronted with something in, in this notation, f of 10 equals 27.5, what does it mean in this situation? Well, 10 is the x. That's my input. You input this into my function. And so this is the minutes. And my output is the answer that I get. Now, if I put this into words, trying to be as specific as possible, I can say that, so at 10 minutes, the coffee temperature is 27.5 degrees Celsius. And there we have it. So that's a shorthand. Mathematicians always are very lazy, I mean very efficient. You want to write it in as efficient a manner as possible. So this notation, this right here, means as much to a mathematician, which you are all becoming, as this entire sentence. And you can condense a lot of information into a very small space with notation. Let's just quickly review our ideas from the, the previous video, which was about independent variable, dependent variable. This time you should pause this and see if you can put these terms at the bottom, right down here, in their correct category. So I will do that now. Independent variable is our input. It is our x value. And that is all the, the x values that will work are what we call our domain. If you think about the juicer, the, the domain or the x values, the inputs were the, the oranges, apples, carrots. Um, dirty socks are actually not in our domain. That would be a restriction on our domain, which we'll get to in a second. So I have input, x value, domain. Those words should all link in your brain with independent variable. When you hear one of them, you should think that it, it is related to those others. Um, as far as dependent variable, that's our output. It is our y value. And all the possible y values that will come out of that function are what we call our range. And this leaves this little lonely f of x. Well, f of x is just a f another way. It's a fancy notation for our y value. OK. Um, then last thing I want to talk about restrictions on domain and range. Uh, and there's two ways to think about this. Practical restrictions are what makes sense in our context, in our problem situation. For domain, it's very often positive. We often don't want to think about negative domains. Um, in our coffee situation, the time before time zero makes no sense. And so our restriction would be x would be greater than or equal to zero. That is often true. And then our range practically was um, no bigger than 20 than f of x, and, and all the way up to 90. Now, I think practically, we probably do hit that 20, and so I could equal 20 degrees. Now, theoretical domain and range is based on just the equation or the graph. And there's two things that will restrict our domain theoretically. The number one thing we cannot do mathematically, so when you're trying to figure out what your domain is, is you cannot divide by 0. So you're looking for values of x that would make you divide by 0. For example, if f of x is 1 over x, then for my domain, I would say all x's such that x could not equal 0, because that would make me divide by 0. Or if I do f of x is 1 over x minus 2, my domain becomes x cannot equal 2. 2, putting 2 in for x right here, would make me divide by 0. The other big problem and restriction is um, taking the square root of a negative number. So for example, if I take the square root of x minus 2, okay, 
If I put in 2 or 3 or 2.5, that's fine. As soon as I put in a number lower than 2, I am going to take, like, say, for example, 1, square root of negative 1. So my domain becomes x is greater than or equal to 2. And that's our theoretical restrictions.